Hello, this is Hawker Muddlefoot, student of science. You're probably listening to the St. Canard Files, a Darkwing Duck podcast. But I'm not sure, because I've only checked my calculations twice. Let's get Paleolithic. Welcome to the St. Canard Files, a Darkwing Duck podcast. I'm your host, Mike Russo, and... Tiffany Silverbron. All right. How you doing this tonight, Tiffany? Pretty good. Glad to hear it. Glad to hear it. What's new? Um, nothing much. <laughs> well... Not work is pretty slow right now for me. Yeah, well... Um, I don't know if I mentioned it in any previous episodes, but my job got sacked pretty hard with Omicron uh, right after Christmas, and it's finally leveling off. Things are finally back to normal at work, so life is settling down a little bit. Knock on wood. Yeah, it's been crazy for me, too, for the same reasons. (laughs) Well, um, one thing we want to talk about 2022 has not been really kind to celebrities, has it? <laughs> no, not at all. <laughs> we've lost a whole bunch, so we figured let's spend a couple of minutes paying tribute to some of the people we've lost. Um, the one that still hurts and the one that people are still talking about, even almost a month later, um, is Betty White. But that's also technically the 31st of December. Yeah, <laughs> but, you know, it, it feels so fresh. <laughs> yeah. And you have to have done something right in your life to almost be a hundred and people still act like you were too young. Yeah. Um, you watch Golden Girls. You told me you did. Yep. <laughs> and I did. That was like a that was appointment television when I was a kid. We'd go over to my grandmother's house, we'd turn on NBC, we'd watch Golden Girls long before it was rerun to death. We were watching it. <laughs> I haven't watched Hot in Cleveland, though. No, I've never seen that. I'm I'm happy getting my Betty White fix from Golden Girls. Yeah, she's great in that. That show was fantastic. It still holds up. Yeah, for sure. I miss sitcoms when, like, all of the actors and actresses, like, were fantastic at what they did, and the audience was live. Yeah, I was just talking to someone about that. They used to have like comedians and really good actors on sitcoms. And I don't feel like they do that anymore. (laughs) Well, going all the way back, me and my wife, like watched most of I Love Lucy. I'm going to say most of, because Hulu only has like 75% of the episodes for some reason. Oh yeah. Um, But it's so great to listen to how the studio audience reacts to what they do. I know. (laughs) I love that too. And there's no faking that. Um, I just got the DVD box set for Christmas because I was frustrated about that same thing, how it's every episode that has a musical number in it, which is like the best I Love Lucy episodes are the ones that, that are available. Is that why? Yeah. <laughs> there were that many? Yep. Okay, I'm going to have to look into how to... You'll, tell me later what you got, because I want to look into that. Um, so yeah, that was Betty White. Um, then who went after that? Um, let's see. Is it Sydney uh, Poitier? Yeah. yeah. I don't script. have too much familiarity with him, do you? Um, yeah, I mean, well, he was the first um black man to win an Oscar, which is pretty awesome. That he is also- true. Yeah, it is awesome. And then yeah, I guess who's coming to dinner? I'm a, a big fan of that, which it's crazy watching it now. <laughs> I don't but know I'm- if you've seen it. But I will say he lived a very distinguished career and a very long life, much like Betty White. Um, But then Bob Saget passed away. Yeah. What was he, 65? Yeah. That was too soon. Yeah. (laughs) That was ridiculously sudden. Shocking. And we all know, we all watched him on Full House. Say what you love about the show now, but we all watched it. 
all of us did. Did you? Yeah. Of course. <laughs> TGIF. Like everybody watched mm-hmm. TGIF. <laughs> and uh, America's and Funniest he, Home Videos. <laughs> and America's Funniest Home Videos. So we'd see Bob Saget on Friday nights, and then we'd see him on Sunday nights too. And uh, nothing, not to um, call the other guy out, but nothing made me appreciate Bob Saget more than seeing the guy that replaced him on America's Funniest Home Videos. Oh, Tom Tom Bergeron? Yeah. <laughs> then they had Daisy Fuentes on there, too. Not a fan. <laughs> I think now it's, um, what's his face? Carlton? Oh, really? I didn't even know. I think he's on there now. I actually... I don't, th- I don't think it's know. Tom Bergeron anymore. I didn't know it was still It on. is. Believe it or not, it's still on. That seems weird in the age of the internet where YouTube is basically America's Funniest Home Videos. <laughs> I think it's like The Simpsons. It's an institution now. Uh, so, yeah, we lost Bob Saget, and then we lost Meatloaf. Yeah, and I was a was, big Rocky Horror Picture Show fan. Yeah, that was a random one. But, like, the same day, almost. Yeah. Also, Louis Anderson. Yeah. <laughs> like... I didn't even have time to process meatloaf and then Louie Anderson went. Yeah. What are your Louie Anderson memories? Do you have any? Um, from back in the day, uh, at, let's see, he was in Ferris Bueller and he was in coming to America. And I remember, um, he, that cartoon show on Fox kids life with Louie. Right. Watch that all the time. And, um, yeah, baskets. I love that show. As um, Ma- Christine Baskets, <laughs> right, and that explains the picture I've been seeing him flo- <laughs> of him floating around. I didn't know what that was from. I didn't know there was a movie called Baskets. So, oh, it's a TV you- show. Oh, a TV show. Well, there you go. You you <laughs> taught me something tonight. Um, my my um familiarity with Louis Anderson. This is an odd one, but if you guys know me, it makes sense. Is when he was hosting Family Feud. And there was a week where the Muppets went against the Dixie Chicks. But it was that really super weird time in the Muppets when Frank Oz had just retired and they hadn't replaced his characters yet. And Dave Goals wasn't there either. So there was no Fozzie. There was no Piggy. There was no Gonzo. It was Kermit, Sweetums, and a whole bunch of characters from Muppets Tonight that nobody cared about. <laughs> it was the and they, and they lost four out of the five days. Aw. I know it was sad. Um, so, can you find that online? I would love to see that. It might be online. I'd have to look. I, I think it is. Most Muppet stuff is on YouTube because a lot of it's just not streaming. Um, but that's how I know Louis Anderson the most. It's the I know it's the oddest thing, but that's me. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, we lost a lot of people already, and the year is not even a month over. Yeah. Let's, uh, let's hope things don't continue down this. Oh, uh, one more, Ronnie Spector. I, I don't know who that is. She's the singer from, from the Ronettes. Never mind. Yes, that's yes. I did hear about that. <laughs> um. So, getting to our main event, of course, it's Darkwing Duck. Before we start issue five, I want to do a bit of an addendum to some of the stuff we talked about in issue four. Obviously, we weren't too keen on that one because a lot of the writing was a little weird. So I figured, you know what? I'm going to go back, grab Definitively Dangerous, which last I checked is not on eBay. Like it it might as well not exist because I can't find copies of it anymore. Uh, I'm glad I have one. I'm upset you don't. (laughs) Me too. (laughs) It would be wonderful if you had that to reference. Maybe it'll happen at some point while we're doing this. I really hope it does. But even if it shows up, it's not going to be cheap. Um, Yeah. But I checked out a few things. A lot of the dialogue is different. I didn't think they were changing things that soon, but I guess they did. Uh, The lie down and take it line is gone. (laughs) <laughs> because I'm not shocked about that one. But a lot of the dialogue is different. But that one is gone. But they do explain what happened to Taurus Bulba. 
indefinitely dangerous, he went to war with Fowl and lost his cyborg body. So at least that's explained. Wait, so is it just dialogue that explains it? or No, it, the art wasn't changed. I think a little bit of the art might have been changed just to update some of the drawings on a case-by-case basis, but the main difference is just dialogue. Okay. But it makes a lot more sense, a lot of the writing. Even Megavolt's inner monologue sounds more like him in my head. <laughs> but they do a much better job just clearing things up And that's going to be true going forward in almost every issue now where things that don't make sense in the boom versions, you pick up definitively dangerous and you go, okay, that is so much more clear. Or that sounds more like the character or that just makes more sense or that's more in character. Um, So as we go along with issue five, I'm going to point out certain things, not a lot because that would take forever, but I'll point out significant things. So so the new story arc is called Crisis on Infinite Dark Wings. (laughs) And we have two covers. We don't have any more cover Cs. We just have a cover A and a cover B. Sabrina Albergetti gets the honor of getting cover A. And it's a doozy. Describe (laughs) cover 5A for us, Tiffany. It is in the middle of the city, and you see Darkwing and Launchpad with a scared look on their face, and they're surrounded by different versions of Darkwing, (laughs) one of them being uh, like a Silver Surfer version that's all gold instead of silver, a bowling ball, a two-headed Darkwing, a sumo Darkwing, a flying monkey Darkwing, a spacesuit Darkwing, and most importantly, Dark Warrior Duck. So, um, except for the two-headed Darkwing and the space Darkwing, these guys are not in this issue. So my one beef with this is even though it's a gorgeous cover, it gives some stuff away. Espe- yeah. Especially Dark Warrior Duck. And the bowling ball Darkwing, which is just a joke, <laughs> but it's a funny one. Oh, and the, there's a like a werewolf one, too. I forgot. Up on the building, yeah. yeah. Howling at the moon. I will say, though, out of all the covers so far, this one relates the most directly to what happens in the story. Just not in this yeah. issue. <laughs> but I love her art. It's just she gets how these characters are supposed to look. Like, Launchpad is gorgeous. Yeah. And that two-headed Darkwing is very funny. <laughs> so cover... Cover B is a Silvani cover. I love this one. Re- okay, tell everybody what this cover is. So this one is basically the cover for issue number one, except it has Negaduck with a chainsaw, um, chainsawing through it, and he's saying, "Here's Negzy." That's which is a, a shining, shining reference. That's, okay, that's a shining <laughs> reference. Yes, <laughs> and um. <laughs> I mentioned it to you before, but this would make a really cool tattoo. Yeah. Like, just Negaduck ripping that. through your flesh with a chainsaw. <laughs> That's so hardcore. <laughs> um, but I'll, gi- I'll, give, I'll give the my preferences, obviously, to Sabrina's. But this is still a cool cover. Especially for Negaduck fans. So without further ado, let's start our next story arc, Crisis on Infinite Dark Wings. And how do we start? You see um, Darkwing in a very heroic pose, and it's a news report by Dip Dobson for some reason instead of Tom Lockjaw. <laughs> and, and this is something they stick to. Like, this <laughs> Dip Dobson character continues throughout the entire run of the comic. I don't know why it's not Tom Lockjaw, but I still, <laughs> I still hear Scott Bullock in my head when I read this. It might as well be him. Um, so yeah, he's basically giving a little bit of exposition for what's been happening and that Darkwing Duck is back and that he captured Bianca Beakley, the bug master, which is awesome that they include her because she only got one appearance in the original show. Right. There's a person in the background hanging up a poster that says they should give you a comic book. (laughs) And the news reporter says 
they want to kiss Darkwing right on the mouth. <laughs> you would think this would have been changed for the Joe Books version on Definitively Dangerous, but it wasn't. It's pretty weird. <laughs> they left the line alone. But then we get a couple of fishermen who are commenting on how odd that is for someone to say. That's probably why they kept it. Yeah, because at least it's called out. It's it's really weird, but they say something about it. And one of the fishermen is dragged under the water by something. Um, and that's going to come up later. <laughs> it is going to come up later. It's an element of the story arc that bothers me. What? What? <laughs> okay. It's an, well, it's one of the situations where we're going to see as we go along, there's already so much going on in this story. To add what they're going to add in the fourth part of the story is a bit much. As much as I think it's cool. <laughs> anyway, along comes Negaduck and Magicka. They've joined forces. And what is, what's going on with these two? They are in some sort of crazy subway car that's... Um traveling through different dimensions or yeah different dimensions right and um then you get some exposition about the um what their plan what their scheme is and they are going around collecting dark wings from all the different universes so the pro of this team up is i love how magica is written I can hear June Foray in my head because they're very careful to write her dialogue so it sounds like she's got that Russian accent. Yeah, definitely. Because at one point she says, we are making greatest heights, heists, and that's absolutely magic of the spell. <laughs> On the other yeah. hand, Negaduck talks too much. And that's something they cut back on, on Definitively Dangerous. He doesn't talk nearly as much so he sounds a lot more like Negaduck. One thing they, they do change is when he says, we are robbing these alternate realities of something that is or was completely unique, Darkwing Ducks. But in the Joe Books version, he says they're robbing him of something completely useless. <laughs> Which is, why would Negaduck call Darkwing unique? Yeah. Useless especially makes when, so much damn sense. Especially when he's Negaduck. <laughs> So the partnership, it benefits, obviously it's going to benefit Negaduck. He wants to ruin Darkwing's reputation by unleashing all of these alter-dimensional Darkwings on St. Canard. But how exactly is this going to benefit Magicka? So Magicka thinks that um, he's, she's going to have control over Launchpad, which then will... Um, get her to Scrooge and she's going to get the number one dime. Obviously, you know, it's always going to come back to her wanting to get the number one dime. <laughs> Something negative doesn't understand. Yeah. And that I love that line where he's like, yeah, I, I'll rule St. Kennard and you get your hands on one dime. <laughs> he has no idea how powerful that would make Magicka though. Yeah. And uh, she mentions Poe, her brother who was turned into a raven who we see in, like, one panel, lost in the two-headed dimension, and I don't think we ever see him again. <laughs> That's really odd. I mean, I appreciate the reference. Obviously, they know DuckTales, but why bring him in if you're not going to do anything else with him? Yeah, that's a little weird. And I don't see... He's such a a character you could just have be there. I don't know why they wouldn't just have him there. I know, right? I don't know. Like, like she would. I'm surprised she didn't mention, like, well, you know, we'll turn Poe back into my brother because that was her. That was her end game in the earliest episodes. Yeah. But you know, it's never referenced again. We don't see Poe again. Hey, whatever. So here's something else that bothers me about at least this version. Darkwing's in the Quackworks CEO, you know, office with Launchpad, talking about, you know, all the villains have come back and. You know, how he has to protect everybody in St. Canard. He's being incredibly righteous, like more than he usually is. Um, he name drops a couple of villains. In this issue, he mentions the Bugmaster, but then mentions there's a new villain called Blood Thinner. Yeah. Tiffany, does that sound like a Darkwing Duck villain? <laughs> no. 
I the mean, revised ver- there was like it seems like a joke that needed something more to it well the revised version the old villain he mentions is jambalaya jake the new villain is muck duck which oh. pays off in the joe books issues we yeah. finally do meet muck duck mm-hmm. so at least they pay it off whoever blood thinner is though i don't know <laughs> <laughs> so here's what really bothers me. Darkwing gets all depressed all of a sudden and makes a comment that he wishes the crime bots were back. I call no way. Yeah, it's weird. <laughs> like he's he's finally back and now he's so overwhelmed he wants to quit. Again, definitively dangerous, basically just has him a little burnt out and he says I wish there were more of me. That makes sense. Yeah. Uh, We get some gags showing the crime bots on their new jobs, which are. (laughs) A short order cook, gardeners, Edward Scissorhands style. (laughs) Nice. And a personal injury lawyer. (laughs) (laughs) I love that as a joke anyway, having them just reassigned to jobs, even though they're robots, like you could easily just turn them off or dismantle them. But But no, they have to give them jobs. jobs. (laughs) Launchpad mentions, why don't you call Goslin? Darkwing is like, absolutely not. They show a quick little flashback of Goslin doing superhero training. How's that going? (laughs) She's missing them and destroying everything else. Because <laughs> she's, she's wearing a cardboard. blindfold. Sorry, there's cardboard cutouts of the fearsome four and she's trying to shoot them and is hitting everything else but them. <laughs> and Darkwing says, problem is, even without the blindfold, I fear she'd just do the same. <laughs> they, The Joe Books version says uh, she's a better shot with the blindfold. <laughs> which I think is funnier. <laughs> yeah. So Launchpad, in this version of the story, all of a sudden decides, hey, I'm going to cheer Darkwing Duck up. Look who we found. Who'd he find? Morgana. Yay. All right. So Launchpad was sitting around with this knowledge and decided all of a sudden, (laughs) oh, wait, I should tell Darkwing about this. Again, the Joe Books version makes it clear that he called Darkwing to his office to actually tell him this. Which here, that's not clear. It makes it sound like Morgana is not very important to Launchpad. Yeah. Which, no. He cares about her, too. So what happened to Morgana? She's in bad shape. Yeah, she looks crazy. Like, super tore up. (laughs) Yeah, her her hair is a mess. Apparently she walked into a... uh, a star ducks and sneezed and conjured up all of these mythical animals. <laughs> yeah. So that's, yeah. So Morgan is back. Hooray. And then you get like a little um, flashback that looks like a scene from my Valentine ghoul. <laughs> the two of them having a date in a graveyard. Yeah. I'm sure the date ended badly though. <laughs> you always hurt the ones you love. <laughs> right. Some people never change, right, Darkwing? <laughs> you were on that episode. Yep. <laughs> that was a great one. So we get a quick little switch to a new scene where we see Quacker Jack, Bushroot, and Megavolt in jail at the um, cafeteria. If you look, you'll see a Beagle Boy and someone off on the side who I'm pretty sure is Pete. Yeah. And so they say, hey, Darkwing Duck, um, it's, he's on TV. He looks all weird. What is what is happening? Is this Darkwing Duck? No, it is a alternate universe Darkwing that's like a spaceman Darkwing. And he's clearly being controlled by Magicka and Negaduck. Uh, he doesn't get an entrance line on this version, but in Definitively Dangerous, I believe his entrance line is, I am the scream you can hear from space. <laughs> nice. Which is our, obviously, is our aliens reference. And, so Darkwing goes to see Morgana. A, a Starducks in the background. All Starducks here. everywhere. <laughs> so DW goes to see Morgana, and she's basically catatonic. And he talks about the good times, the bad times, and the weird times. Would you describe <laughs> those times, Tiffany? Because they're just terrific. 
the good times has uh, Darkwing showing up at Morgana's house with a box of candy and a bouquet of roses. <laughs> and the, the longest bad... neck I've ever seen. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and then the bad times are that same candy and roses turning into horrific monsters. <laughs> a chocolate monster and a bushroot-esque monster. And then what were the weird times? <laughs> and the weird times was when the thunder quack got brought to life. And he's talking to Launchpad as if he's Audrey too. Feed me, Launchpad. Feed me. <laughs> I, I, I actually, that gets my vote as the funniest gag in this issue. Yeah, I love that. <laughs> so Darkwing talks to Morgana, who has a weird fit and zaps him into a hand. <laughs> A finger. <laughs> yeah, he well, it's a hand, but one finger is Darkwing. <laughs> so we got another interdimensional Darkwing attacking the museum. It's Caveman Darkwing on a T Rex, and he says, "Let's get Paleolithic." And I I hear Jim Cummings' uh, Taz voice in that. Yeah, totally. <laughs> blah, 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 blah. Let's get Paleolithic. <laughs> I I hear it. <laughs> so. Yeah, again, we got Dark Wings from all over the different dimensions running rampant in St. Canard, threatening to destroy his reputation, which is exactly what Negaduck wants. So Dark Wings still trying to get Morgana to talk to him, which brings in a few more characters you like. What's going on? You get Eek and Squeak, who were in a um, story or a vault, and um, Archie. Archie, and yay! She doesn't recognize them. And they all start attacking Darkwing because they think that he's who did something to her. Yeah, and Archie webs up his legs. <laughs> yeah. They should have Archie grumble. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Archie always pissed at the entire world for no reason. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, okay, we finally see Goslin. She hasn't had much to do yet. We see Goslin's school. It's called the St. Canard School for Spirited Youngsters. So that's exactly where she needs to be. Um, the gist of this sequence is that she's daydreaming in all of her classes and all of the answers for the questions the teachers are asking, she thinks can be solved with lasers. <laughs> More importantly, there's some really cool references in these drawings. Let's go through them because there's a lot of deep Disney cuts and they get deeper as we go. Yeah. The first panel shows some really easy ones, and it's it's pictures up on the walls of the school. We got they're, uh, they're Minnie. Cut off. They're cut off, but you know who they are. Yeah. Uh, there's Minnie, Donald, Goofy, Mickey, and Chip and Dale. Easy. First one, simple. The second one, the only one we can see that we know who it is, is Abu from Aladdin. Yep. But the deep cuts are in the last one. A couple of them are easy. We got Stitch and Miko. But then, who are our other three? Then you got Monstro, and um, you got uh, King Leonidas from Ben Hobbs and Broom, or yeah, ben Leonidas yep. from Ben Hobbs and Broomsticks. Yep, it's Just not Prince crazy. John. That was our initial thought, Prince John. Yeah. But this isn't Prince John. This Which is a is, deeper it's cut. Crazy that you could even um, identify it because it's obscured by Goslin's head, but the crown shape shows that it's him and not Prince John. And a full mane. Yeah. And, and we um, also have um, Colonel Hathi from Jungle Book. Yeah. And then, of course, Goslin's walking around, you know, lasers solve everything, I should know, I'm Gosmo Duck. And then one of the kids pulls out his cell phone, and there is a fight between the police and an old Darkwing Duck villain. I don't Who like is that they say old Darkwing Duck villain either because I don't know. Shouldn't it just be a villain? Darkwing Duck villain means that he's like a show. That is a little <laughs> weird, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. It's a little too self aware. Yeah. But who is the old Darkwing Duck villain? Ammonia Pine. <laughs> Why is she driving a pickup truck? <laughs> I don't know. She has her own vehicles. <laughs> and we see her in like one shot, she doesn't say anything. But the police are after her. I mean, this, this this gag is very Darkwing Duck. She stole enough cleaning supplies to build an A-bomb, which is an air freshener bomb. <laughs> She's going to make the whole city smell like new car smell, which will destroy the automobile industry. 
It's yeah. dumb, but it's Darkwing Duck. Totally. And then the line that says, you know, it's times like this, I wish we had lasers is very Darkwing Duck, too. <laughs> it pays off the Goslin joke, too. Yep. <laughs> so along comes Darkwing, but dressed as Quiverwing Quack. Uh, it's not explained. We do get a really bizarre explanation in a couple of issues from now. Um, he doesn't talk, but um, they're confident it's not going to matter. Nega Duck and Morgan, uh, Magica. And what does uh, Quiverwing Duck do? He shoots flaming arrows at the police. Not at ammonia pine but the police and one of the policemen says i don't know what happened but i know what will darkwing duck is going to pay so uh darkwing is in trouble now <laughs> so back to darkwing and morgana we get a flashback about the last time they spoke to each other um i'll let you take this one since you're such a big morgana fan um so it's darkwing at morgana's house and she's saying you, you know, you're leaving me. And he explains that he can't do anything anymore, um, that the crime, he can't do anything anymore because he doesn't want to put anyone in danger and crime bots are there to take over. And so he's going to quit being Darkwing. And Morgana and, is... Oh, telling, go on, I'm sorry. Uh, Morgana is telling him how important he is and can a crime bot turn a supervillain into who she is today and Darkwing leaves Morgana in the middle of her talking to him. And the big reason why he leaves is this obviously happened after Negaduck attacked their house and he knows he's got to pack it in for everybody's safety, but hasn't told her that. And she name drops Negaduck. And that's what seems to hit him because his face in the drawing yeah. is devastated he's triggered and that's and that's the big reason why he leaves because he realizes morgan is saying you know you can stand up against negaduck but the only reason why he wasn't pulverized in that fight is because the crime bots captured negaduck um and of course looking at the drawings here there's a few more references notice the bearskin rug on the floor yeah. <laughs> Humphrey the bear. Yeah. <laughs> Somebody skinned Humphrey. That's a that's a deep cut too. <laughs> and the candelabra right below it is a candelabra from the haunted mansion. Yeah. And you got the um the Medusa too. Yes, there's a Medusa back. I don't know if it's a reference to something, but I think it's the one from Haunted Mansion too, possibly. Right. Um, so Darkwing is able to bring Morgana back from her little catatonic state. I'm not feeling it. How does he do it? Uh, <laughs> he <laughs> cries and a single tear drops on her beak and she snaps out of it. Do you know this issue was published the exact same year that Tangled came out and <laughs> Tangled ends pretty much the same way? <laughs> um, yeah, uh, I'm not really a fan of that, but... I mean, I guess she's a witch, so I could try to rationalize it that way. <laughs> but it brings her back. Her hair is back to normal, finally. And they kiss, and they, you know, it's it's a little corny, but at least she's back. It's a little fast for me, too. Yeah. But at, at least they're together again. For now. <laughs> And I will take a moment to say, as much as I love Silvani's art, he's so iffy on how he draws Morgana. Like, she's not as perfect as I wish she was. Yeah, there's a lot of awkward um, drawings in there. There's something going on with her lower part of her beak, where a little too big. Her but, eyes, you know. too, and some of them. You know, I would imagine she's a hard character to get 100% right without her looking weird. Yeah. Because <laughs> she's got a very, she's restrained. If you exaggerate her, it's not Morgana anymore. But, um, so Launchpad and Goslin come in with the cell phone, all these characters carrying around cell phone. It just seems so weird on Darkwing Duck. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, it should be trapped in the time period the show was made. That's my opinion, at least. 
And so the chief of police, not the chief of police that we know from the episode, let's get respectable, a Commissioner Gordon ripoff. <laughs> what does he say? Um, he did an investigation and um, found out. Uh, wait, what does he say? Oh, he declares that Darkwing Duck is, and then you see like a one page panel, public enemy number one. And he holds up a photo, which is the first page of the story, uh, without the dialogue bubbles. But with all the <laughs> every yeah, there's black bars over everybody's eyes except Darkwing. So that wraps up part one of Crisis on Infinite Darkwings. And I do notice the very back cover has an advertisement for the Chippendale Rescue Rangers comic that came out in December. This issue came out in October. Um, I didn't have any of those Rescue Ranger issues. But I do remember the art was gorgeous, but the storyline was hot garbage. <laughs> I didn't read them. From what I understand, this was a time when someone at Boom said, oh, yeah, Disney Afternoon stuff will sell. And they went crazy without having much of a game plan. And apparently the Rescue Rangers comics were not very good and didn't have the care that Darkwing got in terms of just the writing and the, the shout outs and stuff. But maybe one day I'll read it, see if I'm proven wrong. You weren't that big of a fan of the show, though, either, right? I have huge nostalgia for it. But going back and watching it as an adult, I don't think it holds up that much. <laughs> There's a handful of good episodes, like really good episodes. But a lot of it is filler. I haven't done a full rewatch. Just it's in there. It's one of those shows that starts super strong. Like when you do the first like 13 some odd episodes, all the ones that were animated in Japan by TMS, they're all strong. But then when you get deeper into it, it's it it gets very repetitive. And it, it I don't think it holds up as well as Tailspin or Darkwing Duck. Or I mean, DuckTales, of course. Isn't it like aimed towards a younger audience too? I think the audience for Rescue Ranger is definitely skewed younger. I will. I definitely think so, too. The characters had no depth, and that's what happens when your main character is a Chip and Dale. They don't have depth. <laughs> but I know the show has its fans. I, I mean, they're making a Disney Plus TV movie. So it's popular enough they're doing something with it. Whether or not that's going to be good. About that. <laughs> what? I'm so curious about that. I don't think it's going to be good, but I'll watch it. If it turns out to be a train wreck, at least it might be an entertaining train wreck. <laughs> but I heard something about the people writing this were inspired by Space Jam, which oh. really worries me. <laughs> like, apparently I, Roger yeah, Rabbit so has bad. a cameo. In oh, what universe sure. is this set in where Roger Rabbit has a cameo? That's weird. So wait, so, is it going to be live action people? Apparently. But how CGI are the characters going to be? Like photorealistic CGI chipmunks or like cartoony, cartoony characters? Because doesn't this come out this spring and we haven't seen a single photograph of it yet? Yeah, I keep trying to see stuff of it. I haven't seen anything. That doesn't bode well. <laughs> And that makes me worry about Darkwing Duck, what path they're going down for that reboot. But anyway, getting back to Darkwing Duck, uh, what would you rate issue five? Um, I, I'd give it a four. Okay. I, I actually, there's a lot of problems with like the dialogue, I think, but I like the story. I like where it's going. It has a nice, like a, uh, what do you call it? An ending that pulls you in. Right. The story's going to be. Um, I, yeah, I mean, it's just the dialogue. I mean, when I really think of it, like, I like what they're doing with Morgana. I just didn't like how she got, she came to. <laughs> well, now that that's out of the way, you know. <laughs> yeah. And um, there's a lot of funny parts in it, too. And again. This is much funnier funny. than issue four. Yeah. I'm going to give it the same the same score. I'm giving it a four because I do love the Magicka Negaduck team up. I mean, Magic is written really well. I hear June Foray and all of the dialogue. It's nice to have Morgana back. 
even though we only saw, saw like Gothmo Duck for one panel, that scene was funny. The Audrey Two Thunder Quack was funny. And it's setting it's 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 a decent story, all things considered. Things haven't gone totally crazy yet. Yeah. But it's slowly <laughs> building to it. So it's a good issue. A few things bother me, and that's gonna be this that's gonna be every issue at this point of boom. Especially now that I have to compare it to definitively dangerous. You <laughs> see how much stronger it could have been. Yeah. But it's still even, you know, even without that to compare it to, it's still strong. It's still it's a fun story. So I'll give it a four, same as you. Uh, next episode, we've got part two of Crisis on Infinite Dark Wings, issue six. We find out, you know, more about all these interdimensional dark wings, uh, what's going on with Morgana. Should be a good time. I don't know if I mentioned this before earlier for some reason I didn't, but Magica is um, Magica and Gizmo Duck are my favorite DuckTales characters, so I was definitely excited about Magica. <laughs> Why is Magica your favorite DuckTales character? I don't, she's just, I love June Foray, and um, she was slightly different in the comic books. But, she was, um, yeah. <laughs> I I don't know, I think she's hilarious. I think she's I great. think I think in the comics, Magica wasn't like as powerful a witch. Yeah. I mean, she wrote a broomstick. She had, like, foof bombs she'd throw at people. But she wasn't, like, as powerful as she was on DuckTales. And, of course, the DuckTales version was not as powerful as the one on the new DuckTales either. Yeah. Which and is a completely different funny. kind of... <laughs> Go ahead. No, I was just saying that it's funny that she keeps getting more powerful. <laughs> it's just a shame that um, Magica didn't appear much in the later seasons of DuckTales, she was in one episode. Yeah. But that one had Gizmo Duck in it. She has like a different accent in every <laughs> version of her. Well, the one episode she was in in the later seasons was The Unbreakable Bin, and that was a Carl Bark story. The only difference in DuckTales, obviously, Gizmo Duck's in it. Yeah. So, yeah, your two favorite characters, they shared one episode together. <laughs> yeah, June Foray was great as Magica. I think she was even better as Mob Eagle, though. Oh, yeah, definitely. <laughs> I love Mob Eagle, too. Like, she she was a fantastic actress. It's amazing when you realize she goes all the way back to classic cartoons. Yeah, and she was working, like, in to her 90s. Well, she did Magica for the DuckTales remastered video game. Yeah. I, I don't know what some I of her have... last roles were, though. It might have been one of might have been one of the last ones though. She did uh, miss the misadventures of Flapjack. Right. Later in her life, I don't know. And she was doing Granny from uh, Looney Tunes till the very end, I think. Mm. Yeah, but... I actually met her once. That was crazy. Oh, I, cool! Good for you. At um at the post office, it was super random, and it was just. I was delivering a package and I like heard her and I didn't even know what she looked like. And I was like, Oh my God, are you June for <laughs> He's like, yeah. And I was like, can I get your autograph? And did you? <laughs> yeah. She was super duper nice. Nice. What did yeah, she autograph? Like whatever you had on you. Yeah. Um, and she, yeah, it was like, she wasn't, you know, obviously it was just her normal voice and I could still like tell that it was her. <laughs> That's that's awesome. Good for you. Well, I guess that wraps up this ish, uh, this issue and this episode. Uh, so we are the St. Canard Files, a Darkwing Duck podcast. You can find us on all podcast apps, Stitcher, Spotify, Google, iTunes. You can watch us on YouTube, uh, iHeartRadio, Pandora, Pocket Cast, Radio Public, and Facebook. And Tiffany, do you have anything you want to plug or where can uh, fans find you? Uh, yeah, I'm on YouTube at Radio at Tiffany, and I'm on Instagram at Tiffany Silverbron and at Regurgitating Gertie. I also have some um, some tribute art that I did for some of the celebrities that we mentioned at the beginning. Came right back around to it. <laughs> yeah. Where can that be found? On Instagram. Awesome. I should go check that out. So, until next time, guys, she's Tiffany Silverbron. I'm Mike Russo. This is the St. Canard Files. We love Dark and Duck. And have a wonderful <laughs> night. 
<laughs> trying something different tonight. <laughs> have, a, <laughs> have a wonderful night, and everybody stay dangerous. Bye.